All right, welcome to my talk. Uh, does it sound all right? Yep. All right. Uh, I hope to shine some light on the world of the development of uh, so-called dark nets and, and anonymity networks because I think in our industry we mainly hear about them from like an OSINT and like incident response sort of perspective of like oh these you know they're posting stuff to these dark net markets so we got to investigate it. And, yeah, so we don't typically think about the other side of it too much, but I have a passion for this stuff, so I, I have spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, this talk won't be too technical, because uh, uh, I think most people here probably have, don't have like computer science degrees, so I can answer any more technical questions that I get more specific at the end. And I'd like to give a thanks to our sponsors and the organizers for putting on this con because it's been a lot of fun. And without them, we couldn't have this happen. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, right now, I work for an MSP. And that's also just kind of more of a general IT and security company. I've done a little bit of reverse engineering as well. And uh, I also have kind of dabbling in starting a privacy tech business as a side thing this year. And so I made it like an SMS uh, provider that was like focused on privacy. And I've done some like steganography um, research. And I also love to hike. And I, I'm actually a ballroom dancer a little, though I haven't done that too much recently. And this is actually my third version of this talk, but I've made like changes on every time I've given it because of just continued work on my projects. So uh, this talk is going to start with my philosophy on technology, and then I'm going to go over some uh, requisite uh, concepts, which will honestly be kind of a crunch thing because I don't have uh, time to teach a full semester uh, university course in 30 minutes. Um, and then I'm going to go over some of the biggest existing anonymity networks, which isn't an exhaustive list, but uh, I think like most people are only familiar with Tor, because uh, that's the, definitely the most popular one. But there are several others that have their own dedicated communities. And then I'm going to introduce my own project, which uh, I'll, I'll get to at the end, but I've been working on that for a long time, so uh, I'm always excited to talk about that. So uh, my philosophy is, with security and privacy is kind of, uh, is pretty capabilities oriented. So there's a lot of companies out there, like email providers and VPN providers that like say they don't log and they don't keep customer uh, records beyond what's necessary. And you know, a lot of them are probably telling the truth, but the fact is, is if they're in a position to be able to start keeping that data, they probably will, or someone who compromises them probably will, uh, such as like a court order or anything. So I think that uh, as a programmer, I can help develop systems that uh, help users keep control of their own data using uh, like heavy cryptography and peer-to-peer um, -peer networking and things such as that. Uh, it also applies to censorship, so you know, when someone posts something like really offensive on like Facebook, say, you know, a lot of people will finger point and say that the platform is responsible for that content. And they, they kind of have a point because it's kind of like inviting like unsavory people into your house uh, or like people who might not be popular. And, like, you know, if you associate with those people, it's not really like that big of a stretch to say that like you're kind of involved with them. Um, I also am really big on free software, as in, as in GNU and Linux, uh, because I think um, while open source software definitely can be insecure and privacy invasive, uh, it's easier to audit that and make sure that, and then that, that way you actually know what the software is doing. Even if you don't look into it yourself, um, other people are going to do that, especially if it's popular. And then I, I uh, truly believe that privacy is a human right, and that's been recognized by the UN. And so uh, you might think you have like nothing to hide, so, but you know political winds can always change, and horrible things can happen. Um, and if you're uh, 
running a company and your customers might need privacy. Like a big example is like dating apps in countries that aren't friendly to like LGBTQ people. Like you can really put them at risk if you don't properly protect their location and, and such. Um, and like historically, a lot of businesses didn't like you know audit their customers. I mean, even today, you can like walk into a gas station and buy stuff. So. Uh, if we use cryptography and other protections to protect uh, customer data with our darknets, uh, what is usually called a darknet, um, we just don't have that data on hand in order to be uh, stolen. So, beginning with the concepts, the, the biggest concept that you have to wrap your mind around is metadata, which I think people have a decent, under, like a basic understanding of it, but they don't really understand the ramifications fully as it, as it applies to personal privacy. So end-to-end -end encryption, like Signal and WhatsApp, and I, I think even like MyMessage and stuff, is uh, like pretty widely supported, but that doesn't really matter because a lot can be inferred if, you're, if you have a powerful enough adversary just from who you talk to and when and where you go, where you spend money and things like that. And um, you know, the, there's a very tight public-private relationship between companies, so I like to kind of assume that if my data is being collected by a company, then it's probably being sold and probably being shared with the government, perhaps even without a warrant. Uh, and anonymity networks are really all about protecting metadata, uh, as, well as, as, as well as data, of course. So, And then uh, just a really quick crash course on onion routing because it's the, by far the most popular method of anonymity networks. It's basically just a, a series of proxies, that's all it is, but with chain encryption. So it's, it's like imagine if you chain a bunch of VPN services together. It just has uh, more intelligent, like uh, somewhat random picking of um, nodes to use. Uh, but that's a really complicated topic beyond the scope of this talk. Um, there's a, a, onion routing networks are typically fairly centralized and there's reasons for that because uh, you don't want people to just be able to spin up like a thousand nodes and completely take over the network. And so uh, the main concept when you're uh, working on, an, uh, when you're, uh, excuse me, reviewing or working on an anonymity network is the anonymity set, and basically that means that, like, uh, let's say um, uh, I made a, a post like slandering some of the organizers of this con. Like, I wouldn't do that, but like, let's say someone did that, and well, the, they they can like look. They would just one thing they could do is they could look at the log for everyone to use the Wi-Fi here, and if they know that the post was made over Tor, and there was only one person here using Tor. Uh, they probably know who that was because they can just like match it to the MAC address. So uh, the anonymity set would just be one person here, and that's a really hard problem to address. Uh, but you know, in some cases, your anonymity set is a lot bigger. Like if you're just doing normal web browsing uh, on Tor, you have you're basically set with all the other Tor users in the world. And uh, I think. Like some, some things that exist just in normal routing and like radio, uh, it applies to anonymity networks. Like um, one thing you no one will really think of is like in a, in a really broad sense, just like a general like AM radio station that your grandpa would listen to, uh, is kind of like in a sense an anonymity network. Like not really, but you know you can't really identify the listeners of these stations. And, but no one really like thinks of radio stations like that as anonymity networks. And the same applies to just like general IP. Like you know, if you have like a, a thousand devices behind the net, and you know, there's there's definitely ways to trace them. But you know, it's not just as trivial as looking at the IP that's visiting a web server because you don't know which device uh, behind that IP is actually doing it without doing some uh, additional effort. And then uh, reverse proxies hide websites as well, but we don't think of those as anonymity networks. Um, 
development of peer-to-peer -peer networks and anonymity networks uses uh, a ton of graph theory. So it's uh, I'm not going to get into it in this talk, but uh, if you get involved in these projects, you kind of need to know it as well as statistics. And then um, there's everyone's heard of decentralization, I think, with like things like Bitcoin and cloud providers and such, but Really, we have an additional concept to, so, uh, to decentralization, which is social decentralization. So, if you uh, like, let's say like you know, Cloudflare has like thousands of servers, I'm sure, but they're all controlled by Cloudflare, more or less. So, it's not really decentralized in the social sense. Um, anonymity networks tend to be pretty decentralized in the social sense. Sometimes there's centralized components for various reasons, but. Uh, yeah, it's the reason why they provide more protection than just a, a, a so-called no-log VPN. It's because there's not just one entity that can just turn on logging or not. And then um, some networks have a lot of state, like uh, Bitcoin has a lot of state, for example, and like similar blockchains. So you can't just like uh, easily use Bitcoin without without a reliable and strong internet connection, and uh, that's like that's really crappy for countries that have either like uh, no internet or very poor internet or ubiquitous censorship because they can just block your access to like known nodes in the network and then like like what are we developing these networks for if we can't help people who are in the or situations. And I'm not saying uh, networks like uh, I'm not saying like cryptocurrencies like have no place. I'm just saying like it doesn't really provide the full protection that I think people need. And then there's a, a very very tight latency and efficiency trade-off in anonymity networks. Uh, so VPNs are, for example, are typically low latency, if, if, like especially if you pick one that's close by. Uh, I'd say Tor and I2P, which is, a, which is similar to Tor, have pretty medium latency. And then there's these things called mail mixers and uh, similar networks that have been mostly in the past just academic. Um, but they tend to be pretty high latency on average, but it really just comes out to like chance. But I'll get more into those. Uh, and then... Uh, Part of the title on the slide, but uh, yeah. So, anonymity networks are really hard to develop because uh, if if you consider like the, the biggest set of users that you could be a part of to anonymize yourself would just be like everybody. Like imagine like every every uh, device is just connected to like a global like satellite broadcast network. That would be insanely inefficient. So uh, that makes all anonymity networks imperfect because they can't just broadcast to everyone all the time. So the by far the most popular network is Tor, and uh, I've made a consistent table for uh, each network that I talk about. And um, I say I talk about the type of network that it is, which is onion routing, which I already introduced. Uh, Tor is pretty decent with its security. Like there in the past, there haven't been too many really serious like de-anonymization vulnerabilities. Uh, most of the exploits with it have been related to web browsers and the servers that didn't services used rather than the Tor network itself. Uh, but contrary to popular belief, it's actually kind of a centralized network. It relies on, uh, I believe, nine directory authorities uh, to function. So in theory, if you could uh, shut down these nine people, you could wreak havoc on the network. I mean, at minimum, shut it down and probably use it to uh, spin up a bunch of spying nodes and de-anonymize people. But those uh, nine authorities are located around the world, so it's not so bad. Um, it's pretty censorship resistant because it has different ways to mask its traffic, but like I said, you can always censor those nine people. Uh, and then, it has really good user experience, I would say. Like, oh, not perfect, but it's probably the best out of all the popular networks out there. Because, as you can see, you know, it, you've probably used it at least once before. But Tor browser is just basically Firefox, just hardened, so it's pretty intuitive for most people to use. It's just, it's 
just uh, slow and gets blocked a lot. Um, yeah, uh, passive analysis gets Tor users caught though, aside from vulnerabilities. Like the, if you read the extensive uh, documentation that the Tor project has, they, they'll tell you like it's not meant to deter an uh, extremely well-funded like state adversary for a long time, for example. So if you are going to be using it for long term, it uh, goes up like I, I, I don't know, like a lot more I think in the time you'll get compromised. And then there's I2P, which is kind of the sister project to Tor, but it's it's a more decentralized project, both in the way that it's developed and in the way that uh, and in the way that it functions, because it doesn't have as uh, centralized directory authorities, although it does still have some uh, what they call reseed nodes, which is basically how you get connected to the network. Uh, it's also uh, weak to um, spying attacks, aka civil attacks, where people just spin up tons of nodes to watch the network. Passive adversaries. Uh, it's more censorship resistant because it doesn't rely on a hard coded set of received nodes. You can just download a bundle from side channels to get connected to the network. Uh, I'd say it has like pretty poor UX. Like it doesn't, there's not really, they, they've recently published a browser profile for it, but it's harder to set up if, if you're not familiar with the uh, software configuration. So I wouldn't really recommend it for people who aren't very technical. Um, oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention, um, since Tor doesn't have a consistent way to run programs on it, like a form or something, that leads to people making a lot of configuration mistakes. So I think it's on the main network needs to include uh, kind of a sim either semi-official or official app system. And Tor doesn't offer that, but I2P kind of does. Um, if you get the Java I2P variant, there's several plugins that offer a bunch of different things. And you can see, like, this is the default Java I2P interface, which I think has been on a little bit cleaned up, but it's still mostly like this. And, like, as you can see, there's like a dozen different buttons, and it like, gets even more complicated if you go deeper into the menus. So it's it's, uh, you pretty much have to be like almost a sysadmin to run an ITP node properly. And then there's Freenet, which is different than both Tor and I2P, uh, pretty substantially, because it's actually a distributed data store. And in a sense, it was a little bit like blockchain before there was blockchain, because it's a pretty old project. Uh, it's not as like linked together in a series as blockchain is, but it has some things in common. Uh, it's it's a higher latency than Tor because it's not really meant for instant downloading of content. It's mainly meant for slow and uh, persistent storage of data. Uh, its security has been pretty questionable. So there's actually been a very unreported uh, legal case where police actually here in Missouri were investigating people just for using Freenet. And the Freenet project has a blog post on uh, the uh, statistical analysis that the police were using, and according to them, it was pretty questionable. Uh, I don't know it in depth enough to really comment on who is correct, but it's an interesting legal case nonetheless that and anyone who's interested in that kind of politics should look into. Uh, it's very decentralized. You can actually just use it just with your friends and kind of deploy your own friend-to-friend -friend free net network, and that's hard to set up, but it makes it one of the most secure uh, if you use it that way. And it has about the same user experience as uh, I2P, and it has a, an, an uh, app ecosystem as well, but there's only a few that are actually maintained, and I uh, wouldn't really recommend it. But it does have good onboarding. It helps the user set up their software well, because most people aren't going to be able to tell what security options they should use without it being explained in uh, plain English. And there's a screenshot of the Freenet interface, which is actually not the home page, but you can see a bunch of links on the side which uh, link to different configuration options. So it's still not very user, very good user experience. And then probably one of the most modern ones is ZeroNet, which isn't exactly an anonymity network, but it does support uh, some privacy. It does take privacy into account and supports Tor. 
Um, I would say it's actually less anonymous than just using Tor itself because you're just going to be consistently seeing these sites. So uh, you would get compromised over time if someone was actually interested in tracking you down. Uh, it would be a lot of effort to uh, take down everyone hosting a site though, so that makes it very essentially ship resistant. And if they added a DHT, which is basically a way to use torrents um, in a decentralized manner, it would be incredibly decentralized, but this last I checked, they still haven't added the DHT, so it just relies on a bunch of trackers as it is torrent based. Um, it has a very good app ecosystem, so you can actually just visit a, web a, a ITP website in a pretty normal manner, and it'll run on your computer dynamically, but within your web browser, interfacing with a, a ZeroNet API. And so this has allowed people to make uh, very useful dynamic websites like uh, music streaming sites, video streaming sites, and so on, but that, that are completely decentralized and just run kind of in this peer-to-peer -peer cloud. And it has a very flashy interface. Uh, like on the side, you can see a bunch of sites that have, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but like here's a, a mail link and a blogging platform, a form bunch of different useful sites, and it's had a pretty, I don't know, it's declined in recent years, but it's had a pretty interesting and good community. And then, um, around the time of Snowden, Snowden leak, uh, leaks, people uh, came up with this project called BitMessage, which is uh, like a little bit like Bitcoin, but it doesn't involve a blockchain, just uh, some, some similar routing to distribute mail messages, and this network has uh, been pretty much exclusively used for mail because that's the only thing they've actually implemented that I can tell. Uh, it's not really centralized at all, it just has some bootstrap nodes, and it doesn't have any trusted nodes, so it would uh, be pretty hard to take it down. Um, it has a massive user experience fail though, because even though everyone stores every message that gets sent, uh, you have to be online or someone has to be online for you to send a message to them, which is really silly, because you would think they, they could just connect later on and sync the messages, but no. Uh, and it, it uses a uh, gossip protocol, which I'm gonna mention again uh, later uh, soon, which basically it's what it sounds like. It's where, uh, it's like, imagine like gossip when you're from when you were in school, like a rumor will just spread all around the school. Well, instead imagine that was a mail message, uh, couldn't be tampered with, and just everyone shared that around. Well, it's really hard to identify who uh, created a message that way. Uh, Briar is pretty similar, um, but it uses Tor, so it's more anonymous, and it's also pretty much exclusively friend to friend, so it's not as useful for messaging people that you don't already know. But it's uh, also Android and maybe iOS but it has really good user experience. You just uh, connect to your friends and you're pretty much good to go. You can uh, create groups and um, microblogging like Twitter. It's, it's a really killer app. So if you were going to use anything that I talked about today, I would recommend Briar. But you have to get friends to use it too, so it is hard. And then there's uh, Secure Scuttlebutt, which some people may have heard of. It's not an anonymity network, but it does use gossip. Uh, at the end, if I have time, before I finish, I'll show a quick gossip simulation website that demonstrates how gossip works because uh, I rely on it for my project that I'll introduce soon. And then uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum actually use gossip to exchange their uh, to exchange new transactions between nodes. So, in a sense, they actually have some uh, decent anonymous networking built into them, but they've poorly built in protection and spying with that. So. Uh, that, that has led to a lot of transactions being de-anonymized. So some takeaways, there's, uh, there's a lot of these networks typically only use uh, one routing scheme, which makes them very limited for particular uses. And so if you can't use something for everything, I mean, some people will just kind of ditch it. Like you can't use Tor for gaming, for example, so no one will uh, Torify their whole network partly for that reason. Uh, there's usually like no integration with normal web, which in some ways it's not their fault because of uh, walled gardens, but yeah, they don't really tend to compete with like actual social networks and things that people use, which is kind of ironic in my opinion, because like 
I don't know, what, what, what is the internet for except for to exchange information with other, uh, other people? And they tend to be pretty large and it's monolithic code bases. Um, you know, there's not much to add to that. I, I think everyone here is familiar with how complex software gets. Um, yeah, the security issues in there can be really bad. They can literally get people killed. Uh, I've actually discovered a lot of bugs in various networks, and it's yeah, it's not a, it's in a sorry state with a lot of them. I, uh, Tor is actually the best, I would say, in terms of because it's at the most review. So my project is called Onionar or uh, Onion Relay, but I just call it Onion. And it's basically Briar means bit message, so it uses gossip for a lot of things. And I've tried to make it have a pretty sleek interface that you can access from any device. It's, it's definitely a work in progress, so you can't really uh, use it too well yet. But I've been working on it for several years, mostly by myself. But I've had some help. Um, it's transport agnostic like Briar is, so if, uh, both Briar and Onioner will work over LAN or in Bluetooth once I actually add that. But I've added LAN and Tor, so even if there's no internet, like in a natural disaster, you can uh, still use it. And you don't need to expose your IP to use the network. It you know, works behind Tor by default, so it's kind of like layered anonymity. It's like an anonymity network built on an anonymity network. Um, some, and in some more detail, uh, it has like I have made a consistent binary format for exchanging messages. All messages are encrypted, which before I was actually thinking about having plain text messages, but I decided that I had too much like liability for people running the software on the network. Uh, sync time for gossip is actually pretty good. You would think that sending a message to everybody would be pretty crappy, but it's better than just normal broadcast. A lot better. It's. Uh, if you know any time uh, complexity from like a basic computer science class, the like time complexity for that is just O uh, of log n. So like if you have a million nodes, it doesn't take um, much longer than like a hundred million nodes to exchange the message. And messages can be tampered with as well. And then uh, I've added some deniability. Uh, I've been experimenting with dummy messages that are just pretty uh, like just contain garbage, and that way, like you, you can't just observe someone sending a message from their computer and then correlate that to someone who received the message. So there's some deniability there. I still need to work on that more, though. You could probably break it if you try hard. Um, yeah, and you can just kind of. You, can, you don't even have to publish a node onto the network. You can just remotely access another node and uh, upload stuff over Tor. And because of that, it's hard to even catalog all the nodes on the network. Uh, I've tried to keep it very simple. So I've uh, like tried to make an elegant API. And I've kept uh, the concept of nodes separate from users and separate from the plugins. Uh, I've actually made a fairly novel DDF, which is a verifiable uh, delay function, which is similar to Bitcoin's proof of work, but it only works in on one CPU core at a time, so you can't like accelerate it with GPUs, which allows so, like lower power devices to be more uh, more competitive with spammers. So you wouldn't really get a lot from spamming the network other than just frustrating some people and wasting your electricity. So I think going into the future it should be fairly resistant to spam, but I have other ways to tackle that too with uh, Web of Trust solutions, which I'm still working on. And um, by default, everything gets synced to every node, but you can actually, I've added the ability to filter by like types of content. So if you're only interested in mail, you can pick that, for example, and ignore everything else. And then I've added the ability for uh, you to establish direct connections with your friends as well. Um, which this allows you to create denial of service resistant hidden services that uh, you need permission to even uh, discover. So like the address for a service is generated on the fly for each client, which creates high latency for the initial connection, but I think the benefits outweigh that. And then I've uh, created a, a pretty straightforward onboarding process. So you can actually kind of, it helps you uh, pick your settings based on your threat model and uh, what you want to do, and it like sets up consent for how your device should be used in the network. 
And I've used a uh, container and microservice approach, which is in, a, in opposition to all the other networks I talked about today. So instead of a big monolithic code base, I have a bunch of small projects that kind of fit together like Legos, kind of like uh, a lot of uh, corporate people use today to deploy their complex uh, services for their customers. Uh, that makes it a little more complicated for someone to set up, but it, uh, you can always use, I'm thinking about making like thin clients that people can disconnect to, so kind of get the best of both worlds with that. And then my uh, feature plans, uh, this is a non-exhaustive list, but I want to integrate it with Monero and have some uh, more native apps for uh, mobile and have some like a way to install plugins in a sandbox way so like if someone publishes like a, a little website or program you can just uh, easily install that and not be at too much risk. Um, and I want to solve Zuko's triangle which basically means like you can't have a, a uh, like a say like domain name that's human, human meaningful as well as decentralized and secure like the idea goes that you can only have two. But some people have solved that uh, easily with blockchain, but I don't know, that's a pretty hard problem. Uh, they get conflicts with some other goals too, so we'll see. And uh, real quick, you can just see some screenshots. Like here's like my mail program. It's, it doesn't interface with standard email, but the like setup with it is pretty similar. You just uh, add your reference and your address book and then you can mail them. And then here's like a message board where that supports both fully anonymous and pseudo anonymous posts. And um, yeah, I need people to help me. I need so like testers. I need other programmers. I need people to like tell other people who would be interested in helping out with this sort of thing. Uh, so you can check out the project on GitHub. But I'm kind of rewriting a lot of stuff, so. It's not uh, really live right now, but if you want to test it out with me, you can uh, get in touch with me as well. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so please provide feedback on my talk and conference or anything else.